Welcome everyone. Thank you for joining us for today's webinar. My name is Lee Montville and I'm the Director of Special Sales at Springer Publishing. Today we are presenting top 10 conditions and treatment health providers are likely to see in their geriatric acute care practice with Katherine Harris, Associate Professor of Graduate Programs and Faculty in the Acute Care Nurse Practitioner Program at Thomas Jefferson University in Philadelphia. Before we get started, I wanted to mention that this webinar is being recorded. And if you miss any portion of this presentation, you will find the webinar on Springer Publishing's website five to seven business days post event. And if you have any questions today during the webinar, please type them into the Q&A box on your Zoom control panel, and I will ask Katherine Harris them later on. Now, without further ado, we will turn the time over to Katie. Hi, everyone. I'm Dr. Katie Harris. And um, like Lee just said, I have worked um, in acute care for many years, since 2004. <laughs> so as a nurse practitioner, anyway, so it's been a it's been a long time and became a director of the nurse practitioner program at Thomas Jefferson uh, in Philadelphia, and learned quite a bit about the teaching process and learning process. And one of the first things I learned was there was no, uh, there wasn't great material out there that was all focused into one book for acute care. And I brought this up to Springer um, many, many years ago, and their response was, well, you should write a book, <laughs> which, you know, is ultimately what we did. Um, but it really took me down a rabbit hole of learning about all different types of conditions and um, health issues that people have. My focus has always been neurosurgery. So naturally, um, from that experience, we do have an elderly population. So had uh, a steep understanding of elderly patients in uh, the acute care setting. Um, so that is what we're going to talk about today. We'll do um, you know, we want to understand some of those common conditions in the demographic that you need to know about and go more in depth into, because this is the stuff that you are going to see again and again and again in any setting, whether it's it's neurosurgery or ENT or urology. Um, these conditions will cross over all those different um, different types of um, specialties and service lines. So the, the top 10 conditions we'll talk about um, are the ones, obviously, that you'll, you'll see most frequently, and we'll do some discussion around um, how to identify and treat those patients in particular. All right, so uh, this definition of, of elderly patients, medical care for acute conditions in elderly patients, um, as I get older and older, this number just <laughs> is getting closer and closer, and it, it uh, you know, just doesn't seem like it's elderly anymore. Um, I remember when I was a nurse first starting out, and one of the patients I had was on hospice, and they were in their 60s. And I thought that was, you know, I'm like, oh, well, he's, he's old. Um, and now I'm like, oh, my God, that, <laughs> that was not old. And what is elderly at this point? We, I mean, we stick a number to it, but there's a lot of 65-year-old patients who are healthier than, you know, some 45-year-old patients. And we all see that. So there, there's definitely that aspect of chronologic age that defines elderly patients. But I also think there is a degree of um, frailty that identifies um, elderly patients, too. The more frail somebody is, the more susceptible they will be to the conditions that we're going to talk about. <clears throat> Excuse me. So the, the acute care setting, um, this does get a little blurry sometimes too. Obviously, the hospital is an acute care system. Um, the emergency departments um, treat acute care conditions, geriatric wards. Uh, but the, some of the acute care stuff stumbles into, you know, urgent care centers and outpatient facilities where they're doing more and more uh, outpatient acute care um treatments. 
So the focus is uh, tailored to elderly patients' unique needs, their physical, psychological, social. That's something, especially as nurses, we always take into consideration that that whole body, um, what's going on with the person. Did they just retire? Um, did they just lose their significant others? So these types of things are really important to focus on because the um, psychological needs of our patients a lot of times will manifest as physical conditions. Uh, so treating the entire patient is going to be of vital importance. And then of course, in the acute care setting, we have a multidisciplinary approach. This is one of the things that I loved about working in the acute care setting as opposed to outpatient, because on outpatient, you feel a lot more disconnected and um, on your own. Whereas in the hospital system, you get that, you know, you have uh, other nurses, therapists, uh, doctors, pharmacists, you have a whole gamut of people, case managers, social workers that are working with you to help you to treat the, that patient. Um, so some of the common conditions and the importance of understanding these common conditions, we see that elderly patients, um, you know, people are more prone to acute care illnesses. Um, one, because they typically have more comorbidities. So they, um, over time, aging, the aging process and environmental process and just the overall decline that comes with aging can add to having multiple comorbidities. And if you had longstanding hypertension, you know it affects um, your kidneys and it can affect your eyes. So then you start getting all these other conditions, which leads to having multiple me medications. And every time you put somebody on one medication and then they require another medication, how those two medications interact and how they're interacting in the body is beyond anybody's real scope of knowledge, right? So it's very individualized. There's a genetic component, there's an environmental component, how susceptible that person is to changes in the body is extremely important as well. So as the elderly get more conditions, they become more chronic, they become um, managed with more medications, then it all kind of compounds together. So offering a holistic care, addressing the physical, mental, emotional, and social health aspects is, is really important. Uh, prevention uh, is always better. This is something that we've, we saw in neurosurgery for many, many years. Um, preventing brain injury is way more effective than any treatment that we have. And we can certainly uh, do the best that we can, but um, there's there's nothing that's going to bring you back to 100% of what you were. So preventing the injury from happening in the first place is should be the priority, uh, basically, in every specialty. And then uh, having something patient-centered, tailored care, which enhances the quality of life and independence. All right, so the first condition we have is falls and fractures. And uh, this is probably not a surprise. This is one of the things that you know I worry about with my own parents who are in their 80s, and especially um, on a snow day where it's icy. And uh, you know, my dad still thinks that he's 50 and can go out and shovel the snow. And all it takes is is one fall to just catapult. Uh, a patient into just um, a really bad condition. So breaking a hip, um, fracture, other types of injuries that put them at risk for now pulmonary embolism or pneumonia. Um, so in terms of treatment for fracture management, the best um, treatment is obviously prevention strategies. So um, and this can be as simple as going into somebody's house. And there's a lot of Medicare programs where they do that home assessment and they go in and they're looking for rugs that are sticking up, right? Somebody tripping over a rug is, uh, it's actually a huge um, challenge in, in a lot of these houses because you can easily catch on a rug. I actually have a rug um, here that um, in my house that it never completely rolled out and all of us are constantly tripping over it. It's really frustrating. So then we put a double-sided tape on it to keep the, the the edge of the rug laying down flat. So those are some things that, that can be done. 
and looking at, you know, how many steps. Um, another thing that happened in my parents' house was they had these really nice wood steps, but they were super slippery. And I actually fell down the steps myself and it was, it was really painful. And, but after that, I was like, you guys have got to put some sort of runner here because this is extremely dangerous. And that's exactly what they did. And it, it does look nice. Um, I, you know, I love the hardwood floors. They look beautiful, but um, when they're really slippery, it's a problem. The same thing with bathrooms. You don't want to get a, a tile that's like super smooth. You need something that has texture to it so that uh, they don't slip as easily. So those are types of things that um, you want to assess or have elderly patients assess for, or when they come into the acute care setting, you can ask them about these things. So falls and fractures are prevalent among elderly patients. Um, it can cause reduced mobility, muscle weakness, because if they're in bed, uh, it hurts. They Their hip is broken. Um, they can't get out of bed. If they have pain, swelling, limited mobility, they're on pain medications. Um, these all contribute to more issues occurring because of the falls and the fractures. Age is definitely uh, an aspect, especially if they've had bone density loss, osteoporosis, or they're on medications, uh, especially medications that maybe give them some confusion or some uh, delirium or uh, they have infections going on. The treatment for fall management, fall prevention strategies, um, you know, you have physical therapy, uh, you have different assistive devices uh, that uh, that patients can use, um, and really a, a, a holistic approach of, of looking at um, diet and exercise as much as they can manage, right? When, when I talk to my, my dad, again, who's in his 80s about exercise, you know, the <laughs> the conversation is, you know, it, he doesn't want to do it. So I think um, really focusing it on things that you can do where you can get exercise as opposed to you have to, I don't know, go to Planet Fitness and, and work out, right? I think that's what we think of when we, think, when we talk about exercise. But exercise for elderly people could be just a walk around the neighborhood, right? Or... Um, maybe they're raking leaves. Raking leaves is not nearly as dangerous as trying to chop up ice <laughs> in the, you know, in the driveway and uh, clear clear the driveway of of a major snowstorm. So, um, gardening another thing that a lot of um, elderly patients might be interested in doing. Um, but those types of things are exercise and need to be counted for. So if you have an elderly patient that's just in um, a chair constantly, that's problematic. So getting them up and getting them to move, no matter what it is they're doing, is the key as opposed to, you know, you have to do 30 minutes of high intensity training or, or something along those lines. So medications to also consider in falls and uh, fall prevention. So patients that are on the benzodiazepines, antidepressants, antipsychotics, any type of sedatives, even antihypertension uh, medications, because if they get their um, blood pressures too low, it can cause orthostatic hypotension. If their cortisol levels are really low, that might contribute to orthostatic hypotension as well. Diuretics, um, NSAIDs, opioids, anti-epileptics, and muscle re relaxants. And a lot of times our elderly patients are on these medications. Now, the second condition that is quite common in the elderly patients is delirium, which is a sudden change in mental status caused by underlying conditions or medications. And the key here is to understand that um, there's something else going on. So we don't want to treat delirium. We want to treat the underlying cause of the delirium. And, um, you know, typically that can be underlying medical conditions. Um, if they're on medications, especially if they just started a new medication, it might not be the, that particular medication, but it might be an interaction that they're having with that medication with other medications that they're taking. Or maybe they just got some sort of an infection. And elderly patients that are more frail might be more susceptible to infections and might have a more robust response to it than um, you know somebody that's not as frail or maybe not as old. So infections are um, 
you know, that's something that we were very aggressive with, with treating in the hospital system. And this is characterized by that sudden confusion. So somebody that comes in who was fine yesterday and now is confused is delirious as opposed to demented, right? Um, demented is uh, dementia is a completely different um, medical condition and you can certainly have delirium and dementia at the same time. Um, but, and we certainly had patients with like Alzheimer's disease who had uh, advanced dementia who were even more confused. So it was delirium on top of, of dementia. But underlying the, addressing that underlying cause, creating a calm environment, um, and sometimes using me medications in the hospital, we use them to uh, protect our patients. So again, I told you I worked in neurosurgery, and in neurosurgery, um, a lot of times after either before or after certain procedures, we needed them to be calm and we needed their blood pressure low. And if you have somebody um, that has dementia that is all of a sudden delirious as well, and you have them tied down, the, that struggle um, and the stress that that causes increases the blood pressure and makes it extremely difficult to maintain that homeostatic state that you need prior to surgery or just after surgery. So um, especially in hemorrhagic stroke, we couldn't have massive spikes in um, in the blood pressure. So we needed a nice, calm, even blood pressure to work with. Um, and we did use the benzodiazepines. One of the, the medications in particular was Ativan. Um, in giving patients Ativan, you could give a really small dose of Ativan and it could last in the system for almost 72 hours. Like, I, you know, I remember a, a couple patients in particular that we gave Ativan to and it was a really, really small dose. Like it was like the most minor dose that you could give them. And it it knocked them out. Like they, they went to sleep, which was, was great. But by the end of the shift, you're like, I can't wait this patient up. And it was because of the Ativan. It had such a massive load on them that it caused them, it was almost like a tranquilizer. It, it just really knocked them out. So you have to be very, very careful with giving um, patients Ativan, especially if they have any kind of renal conditions. Uh, so conditions that that contribute to delirium, urinary tract infections, any type of respiratory infection, um, sepsis can cause anybody to become delirious uh, for sure. But you know, any type of inflammatory response um, can also affect the brain condition. Dehydration, another really big, um, a really big uh, reason that elderly patients become more susceptible to delirium. And there have been many cases where we gave a fluid bolus and they perked right up. This goes hand in hand with metabolic disturbances. So we always would keep a, a very strict um, eye on potassium, sodium levels, any types of glucose fluctuations. You know, when you come into the ED, that's the first thing they check is your glucose, especially if you're delirious um, and any liver and kidney conditions. Um, we saw a lot of liver encephalopathy um, and delirium in our patients uh, in neuro. A lot of medications that we give, the anticholinergics. So giving patients NEB treatments uh, with anticholinergics uh, can cause delirium as a side effect. And also obviously taking um, polypharmacy. Postoperatively, lots of delirium. Uh, we saw that not just in our elderly patients, but they were very susceptible to it um, as well. And, you know, just having the stress of surgery. Stress is a very big um, compounding factor in delirium. If they already have uh, pre-existing neurological conditions, any type of trauma, psychiatric disorders, these tend to manifest themselves more quickly uh, and more easily in the state of if you have any of these other conditions in play. Uh, chronic illness is already taxing on the body. So if you have multiple chronic conditions like COPD, diabetes, um, any little exacerbation can overload the body, right? So if you have uh, these conditions and you get, a, you know, the common cold that might not affect somebody who's in their 20s or 30s or 40s, they manage with 
the common cold, but because in an elderly patient with multiple chronic diseases, the body's already on a daily basis working really, really hard to maintain uh, homeostasis. So when you add on something as simple as a cold um, or you know a small virus, this can trigger uh, a, a significant delirium that, that where the patient becomes very, very confused. Uh, hospitalization in you know environmental factors again this adds to the stress of of the patient uh, being in unfamiliar surroundings disrupting sleep patterns I mean that was basically my job in neuro was to wake somebody up every hour and ask them where they were and what year it was and who, you know who they were uh, and that was done every hour but and that's you know it's one thing if you do over 12 hours but it's another thing if you do it for five days, right? And that person is not getting any deep sleep. They're not getting any REM sleep. Um, you just, it's impossible with such a small time frame of like hour intervals where you're constantly doing things. So another thing that um, is a huge deal in the hospital system that really needs more research looked at. All right, number three, we have pneumonia. So elderly patients are certainly much more susceptible to respiratory infections like pneumonia. Treatment for this antibiotics, um, oxygen therapy, respiratory uh, support for sure. So you, you know, there's bacterial, there's viral lung infections, there's um, obviously fungal infections, uh, but bacterial and viral being the most common. Uh, symptoms for pneumonia, uh, fever, cough, chest pain, shortness of breath. Um, anytime you have chest pain, that's always a, a scary thing with anybody, but especially in the elderly, uh, you definitely want to rule out any type of cardiac event. Uh, but a fever along with cough, um, this is the triad for pneumonia. Risk factors, age-related weakened immune system. So any, again, the chronic conditions, um, anybody that has multiple comorbidities, exposure to respiratory pathogens. A lot of us live in homes and, and a lot of elderly patients live in very old homes um, and they might have mold in them. They might have other toxins uh, that are, um, that make them more susceptible to any other types of pathogens that are coming in. So treatment is antibiotics for bacterial pneumonia, antivirals for viral pneumonia, if you catch that in time, oxygen therapy, and respiratory support as needed. Diagnosis of pneumonia, um, this can be done with medical history and physical exam, uh, looking at re uh, symptoms, recent illnesses, any type of risk factors. A physical exam would show an increased respiratory rate, fever, chest discomfort, a chest X-ray, if it's pneumonia, um, it will show areas of inflammation and consolidation in the lungs. And you can see that on chest X-ray. It's uh, part of the triad for diagnosing pneumonia. Blood test, you'll have an elevated CBC or uh, white count. Um, in elderly patients, especially if they're on steroids, uh, that white count might not be as high as you expect. It might be higher than normal for that person, but not necessarily high enough to say, oh, this person's got a raging infection. Um, so it's something to consider because a lot of elderly patients will have a lower white blood cell count. Um, so let's say it's you know four or five, uh, whereas you would expect an infection to be 15 to 20, right? Um, but maybe for that elderly patient, a white count of 10 is high. And that could be within the normal range. Um, but still they would have, if they still have a clinical um, manifestation of pneumonia, then I would assume that that would be high for that patient, especially if you didn't have anything to compare it to. Sputum culture and analysis. If the patient can produce sputum, getting a sample of that um, it really helps to guide the antibiotic treatment. Pulse oximetry, again, depending on um, if the patient's got COPD, they might live at a lower oxygen level, um, but this can help assess their oxygenation status. Bronchoscopy in severe cases, um, this is not, this wouldn't be like a first line in any shape. Um, X-ray um, fluids, antibiotics, and breast would be your treatment for uh, bacterial pneumonia. But if there's um, 
if it's really, really severe, you might want to see if there's some underlying cause to the pneumonia as well. A CT scan would be um, necessary if it's unclear what's going on. Um, most of the time, it's just a straightforward consolidation in the lungs. And, you know, if somebody's not getting better or the pneumonia is getting worse, you might want to assess with a, a CT scan. Physical assessment is really your best um, way to assess your lung function, auscultation, and really just palpating uh, or palpation, um, percussion, which is one of those lost arts, I think, but percussion is extremely helpful. And if you get good at it, it's amazing what you can do with percussion. Healthcare providers use the CURB, uh, pretty much we use the CURB 65 to assess the, uh, the severity of pneumonia and guide treatment decisions. Um, and that's for patients over the age of 65. There's also the pneumonia severity index and there's lots of them. Um, these are the types of tools that you can look up online. If you type in CURB 65, it will actually, it's a calculator and you can go through and put your patient's information in, it'll give you the score, and it tells you what that score means too, which is really nice. Um, all right, number four, urinary tract infections, very common among the elderly patients, and these are a huge reason that people get confusion. Treatment uh, for urinary tract infection is obviously going to be antibiotics. Uh, symptoms being frequent urination, and this might be hard to differentiate, especially if somebody's got diabetes, but if somebody's got diabetes and they're confused, uh, urinary tract infection is one of the first things that we think of. So um, any kind of burning sensation, if your patient is confused or has dementia, they might not be able to tell you that. Um, but you can see cloudy urine, and if the, if the patient has fever, and also you can palpate them on their back, um, you know, back, a lower back, and see if that causes them to, to flinch or, because that's when the, the kidneys in, in particular are really inflamed, that touching the back area is extremely, um, it causes a lot of discomfort for the patient. So risk factors, a weakened immune system. So anybody on biologics or, and um, I'm sorry, steroids, um, or any of those types of, of medications can, I mean, the job of, of steroids and biologics is basically to depress the immune system. So it allows people to be much more susceptible to um, any type of an infection, but a urinary tract infection is one of the most common. Antibiotics are tailored to that specific infection and increasing fluid intake to flush out the kidneys is ideal. Once you flush out the kidneys and you're giving people, especially elderly patients, a lot of fluid, you might have um, the problem of urinary incontinence if that's a problem with the, the patient, which can also contribute to falls if they're trying to rush to get to the bathroom because um, they're having a lot of uh, a lot more urine. So something to consider as well. In the hospital system, we do try and, um, especially in the, the last couple of years, there was a huge move away from urinary indwelling catheters. Um, and there was some interesting things to use for women. Um, you know, there was, there's always been the condom cath for men, which, uh, you know, I just, <laughs> I have so many issues with it. One, they never stayed on. And two, um, you know, the first time that they urinate, it's like the whole system becomes a mess and it's kind of disgusting. Um, so at some level, uh, I, there's definitely room for improvement there for helping incontinent-related issues related to uh, urinary tract infections, for sure. Heart failure. Uh, many older adults have heart-related conditions, and heart failure is one of those common conditions. Treatment is medication management, lifestyle changes, and monitoring. I think, um, for sure, lifestyle changes is something we probably don't talk about enough um, for elderly patients, uh, but it's something that could be very effective for them. Uh, heart failure is you know, basically a weakening of the heart muscle, often due to conditions like hypertension, coronary artery disease, or valve disorders. Symptoms include shortness of breath, fatigue, swelling, fluid retention. Your risk factors, um, age, absolutely. Uh, underlying heart conditions, long-standing diabetes, long-standing high blood pressure. 
Uh, medication management is typically with diuretics and ACE inhibitors. Uh, lifestyle modifications is something um, that needs much more attention. So looking at all the different medications that somebody's on, helping them to get up and move around, uh, looking at diet, uh, what what the client is eat, what the patient is eating. Um, I mean, the the low sodium diet. It's it's very hard in the United States to get away from sodium. <laughs> so a low sodium diet might not be the best um, best method or the best way to go. But maybe supplementing sodium for uh, different spices. Uh, there's a lot of uh, spices out there that will help you not miss as much sodium. But part of the problem is is a lot of the uh, foods that you buy, if it's not kind of on the perimeter of the grocery store, you know, like the fruits and vegetables and, you know, your, your meat and fish station um, or um, any type of um, anything that's packaged and in the middle of the store, a lot of it is infused with um, sodium. And even uh, when you look at whole roasted chickens or, or chickens, frozen chickens or chickens in the, um, and you think, oh, you know, if we bake chicken, that would be good. But a lot of times what happens is they inject the chickens with sodium because what does sodium do? Sodium retains water and it makes the chicken heavier. So now they can um, sell it uh, and say it's a heavier weight. So a lot of times um, a whole roasted chicken has more sodium in it than a bag of salted popcorn, which is is really disgusting. So it, it's something to consider. So getting, um, you know, free range chickens and chickens that aren't in, injected with sodium <laughs> is, uh, you know, one of one of the big things that you can do um, to eliminate sodium from the diet, as well as uh, try and avoid can anything which has a lot of sodium in it. So factors leading to heart failure, coronary artery disease, hypertension, any type of valvular disease, uh, stenosis, leaky valves, regurgitation, cardiomyopathy, um, myocardial in infarction, if they've had that, uh, that typically leads um, the surviving um, part of the heart can fail much more easily at this point. And then your chronic diseases like diabetes, lung disease, kidney disease, they all contribute because it's all the same vascular system, right? Um, arrhythmias such as AFib can also reduce the heart's uh, efficiency. And then of course, obesity, these are your lifestyle changes, right? Obesity, smoking, alcohol, substance abuse, age, you can't really do anything about that. Uh, your genetics play a huge role in how you respond uh, to any type of treatment and how you cope with any type of health condition that comes your way and certainly medications. Number six, we have stroke. And this is the area that we specialized in. We did ischemic and hemorrhagic stroke. Um, so this is a medical condition where blood flow is interrupted um, and it's a much higher risk for elderly patients. The treatment really depends on the type, severity of the stroke, and may involve clot-busting drugs like TPA. Um, they've been playing around with um, other medications or doing experiments with um, a group of, of um, molecules called exosomes. Exosomes are, are carrier molecules, um, and they've been using exosomes from uh, young donors, like um, placental donors, um, and they take the exosomes and the exosomes, they have all the information, they're intracellular communicators, and they take the information from healthy cells. And when they're injected in areas of inflammation and um, damage, the exosome molecules go and their job is to explain to the damaged cells how they're supposed to act um, and what they're supposed to do. And they've seen um, remarkable improvement um, in this area. So you might see exosomes on the horizon in stroke because uh, they have done some trials and they're just in animals right now, but they're it's coming to humans uh, very quickly, but they've shown repair of um, stroke damage using uh, exosomes. So that that's new um, and that's going to be in the next five, 10 years, you're going to hear all about those. Uh, stroke is prevalent among elderly patients. Um, 
you know, you have you can have narrowing of the vessel, you can have a clot in the vessel, uh, you can have a bleed, the the a vessel can rupture and bleed into the brain. And it all has um, the presentations slightly different based on the um, how the action happened, but basically an area of the brain gets damaged and that manifest as um, you know, either weakness of the face, weakness of the arm, weakness of the legs, um, something along those lines. The risk factors are advanced age, hypertension, diabetes, smoking, atrial fibrillation, treatment, uh, TPA for ischemic stroke, surgical intervention or no intervention for hemorrhagic stroke. There's not a whole lot um, that we can do. They tried to, in the past, they've done studies trying to like um, remove the hemorrhagic stroke and found that they just did more damage uh, trying to remove the stroke than just leaving it uh, and letting the body reabsorb the blood and, and uh, see how the patient did. Uh, and then it's extensive rehab. And especially for elderly patients, this is really, really hard because they don't have that, um, they don't have that reserve capacity to, um, uh, to come back. And sometimes they don't have the psychological desire to go through all the things that they need to do to get, to get better. So that can be a, a major problem as well. The, the two major different types of strokes, we have ischemic, which is the most common. About 87% of all strokes are ischemic strokes. And a lot of times um, the strokes are uh, thrombotic. Uh, so this is when a blood clot forms in one of the brain's arteries, often due to atherosclerosis. So as you saw in this other picture, you see how uh, the vessel inside is really, really narrow. Well, the blood cells get all backed up and they can cause a clot and that causes a thrombus. And especially if the person's not hydrated, if they're really dehydrated, it just, it creates this perfect cascade of events where the clot just starts to congeal and, and fluid can't get through anymore. Um, embolic stroke is typically um, in patients, let's say you have AFib and a clot develops in the heart and the, the clot gets launched uh, and it'll stop at the area where it can no longer progress, right? So if it's if it's a big clot, uh, it can certainly get stuck. Um, it, it can get stuck anywhere, but you know the, the vessels of the brain get more and more narrow as it gets more and more distal. And so that clot will lodge um, where it can't go any further. Those are the types of clots particularly that are very susceptible to TPA. Thrombotic stroke um, could also, it can be uh, fat, uh, and if it's fat, that will be completely non-responsive to, to TPA. The treatment, um, again, TPA, antiplatelets, um, mechanical thrombectomy, we did a lot of those, uh, extraction, surgical extraction of the clot, uh, and those were wonderful, especially in younger patients, the 40, 50-year-old population. Hemorrhagic strokes, they only account for about 13%, um, though, I mean, we were, um, our facility was a magnet hospital for these, so I felt like everybody had a hemorrhagic stroke because everybody that came in, um, you know, we only saw the hemorrhagic stroke, so it felt like this was much more prevalent than it was, but these can occur for multiple different reasons. Um, there's uh, AVMs, especially in younger people, you'll see this in 20 and 30 year olds, aneurysms, 40, 50 year olds, um, hypertension, you're 60, 70, 80 year olds. Uh, but we also saw it after pregnancy if somebody had preeclampsia and then um, they would they could have a hemorrhage uh, during the, the pushing aspect of, of giving birth. Um, all right, number seven, uh, this is diabetes, a huge, huge issue in elderly patients. Metabolic disorder characterized by high blood sugar, uh, requiring careful attention, obviously, and medical uh, medication adjustments, dietary changes, and monitoring complications. Uh, you know, you can have type 1 and type 2. Type 1 is, is you know, it used to be called juvenile diabetes. Um, this is certainly, um, you can develop type 1 diabetes later in life, uh, but it's not nearly as prevalent as the type 2 insulin resistance, which comes with uh, years of, um, you know, the poor diet, lack of exercise, uh, environmental toxins. Uh, the body is under attack for a long period of time, and it manifests uh, frequently in, in elderly patients. 
the, your first symptoms, increased thirst, frequent urination, fatigue, unexplained weight loss. Um, this should alert anybody to first think of diabetes. Um, risk factors, age, family history for sure, obesity, and a sedentary lifestyle. Medication management, um, uh, they typically start with oral drugs. The oral drugs can also have um, a lot of um, side effects that lead to a, a, the things that we've already talked about, right? The falls, the the urinary um, uh, incontinence that can, or urinary tract infections. Um, and then mitigating complications, because the complications of diabetes are, are can be devastating. Uh, so numbness of the feet in particular, um, doing foot checks to make sure that they haven't stepped on something that's now like causing an infection because wound healing is, is really poor um, in diabetes as well. As people age, their natural body functions change. The pancreas um, becomes less efficient. Uh, poor dietary habits, lack of exercise and weight gain contribute to diabetes. Decreased physical activity um, leads to weight gain and insulin resistance. Uh, hormonal changes, decrease in, in uh, growth hormones and sex hormones like glucose, uh, I'm sorry, like um, estrogen and testosterone play a major role in um, uh, basically insulin, insulin sensitivity. Genetics, family history, um, if you've, it, it's really not, um, if you've had a family history and you don't make any changes, right? You live the same lifestyle that your family lived and eat the same foods and have the same physical activity. Yes, you're going to be much more susceptible, but your genetic genetics don't determine who you are, what happens to you, um, but they, they can make you more susceptible if you don't make the changes that you need to make. Elderly patients, again, take multiple medications. I had one patient in 20 years who was 80 years old and she came in with a TIA and I was doing her health history and she had absolutely no medical history whatsoever. She was on no medications whatsoever. Um, and she was like, oh, should I, should I start medications? And I was like, no, <laughs> you know, whatever you're doing, you had a TIA, maybe go out and exercise some more, but you know, the risk of putting people on medications is very real. Um, they, the, the interactions it has in your body, you just never know how an individual is going to respond to medications. We can say statistically, and we can make generalizations, but when you look at one person in particular, it's impossible to say how they're going to respond, um, to medications or multiple medications. Uh, chronic health conditions um, such as hypertension, cardiovascular risk can also contribute to the risk of diabetes. Age-related changes in composition, um, you tend to get more uh, increased fat, especially as your uh, testosterone and estrogen levels decrease, decreased muscle mass, which is also related to um, a lack of testosterone in the body, can affect insulin sensitivity and glucose control. Limited access to <clears throat> health care. Um, is a, my, you know, it, it's not just limited access, but um, the, uh, it, and it could be, this could be the issue is that they uh, don't have access to healthcare, but also um, even if you do have access to healthcare, you might not have access to your provider's attention, right? You get five, 10 minutes in the office, uh, you have um, appointments that are six months away, my dad had some issues and was trying to call his GP for like three weeks and could not get anybody on the phone. Uh, and that's a common scenario in um, our ever fast paced healthcare system. And cognitive decline uh, makes it more challenging for people to manage diabetes, um, especially with lapse in um, uh, at medication control. Osteoarthritis, degenerative joint uh, treatment is pain management, physical therapy, joint replacement. Uh, you can have wear and tear. Uh, again, this can be related to lifestyle um, choices, the lack of movement, um, diet, lack of exercises. Um, pain management is really analgesics and NSAIDs. Uh, that's what my dad's been getting for his joint pain. He also gets uh, corticoid steroid injections, and he's looking to have a knee surgery. And I was like, 
no. <laughs> I'm like, you just, you almost have to be wheelchair bound before you know, I let you go for knee surgery because this is the same man who does not want to exercise and is not going to be able to go through a, a lengthy rehab. So something to consider. Uh, he also does not want to change his diet, which is pretty bad. Uh, so really just keeping him moving is the best thing that we can do at this point. Affected joints most common are going to be knees and hips and also hands. Uh, you Obviously, um, spine arthritis can cause significant back pain. Um, if you've ever had back pain, you know how how horrible this can be. Uh, I had nerve pain in my lower back and I just wanted, I, I couldn't move, I couldn't cough, I couldn't, I literally couldn't turn in the bed without causing like shooting horrible pain. And I just, I, I would have done anything um, if I could have gotten out of bed. But, <laughs> you know, the, the, that pain is really debilitating. Hips and knees simultaneously, the base of the thumb, the big toe, um, at, can be osteoarthritis, which can be extremely discomfort. Number nine, being dementia, um, can affect memory and cognitive abilities, including Alzheimer's disease, which is it can be common in the elderly. Um, but we're seeing Alzheimer's more and more earlier and earlier, like in your 60s and 70s, as opposed to like 80s and 90s. Um, and a lot of that can be in um, environmental and um, really just lifestyle uh, choices uh, that we've that we've made, um, even without knowing that they were bad choices. Um, like you might think that you're making good choices and, um, you know, like buying a, a chicken, right? That's uh, injected with, with salt, um, which um, it, it's also, it can be progressive brain disorders affecting cognition, such as Alzheimer's results in memory loss. And this is typically over time, you'll see stages of Alzheimer's and dementia. So it's not like this acute confusion, like one day you're fine and the next day you're confused, that's your delirium. But over time, people get forgetful, they can't remember names, they can't remember places, they can't remember events. Um, and it's a, a process that you see happen gradually over time as opposed to like an acute onset. There's no cure. Management involves medications for symptom control, which can lead to other problems that can lead to the other conditions that we've talked about in this lecture. A delirium versus dementia. Again, delirium is acute, often reversible. Dementia is chronic and progressive. Uh, delirium is caused by underlying medical con conditions. Dementia is primarily a degenerative brain disease. Uh, symptoms of delirium can be confusion, disorientation, agitation, hallucinations, and fluctuating levels of consciousness, whereas dementia can include memory loss, impaired judgment, difficulty with language and communication, just as, as you see the brain degenerate um, and as areas of it degenerate, you'll see, um, you know, somebody might forget how to talk or um, they, they might um, start forgetting how to communicate in general or how to get dressed. Awareness. Um, People with delirium are often aware and are extremely agitated and scared that they're confused. Individuals with dementia um, may not um, be aware that they are that they are, have cognitive deficits. Delirium is treatable, whereas there is no cure for dementia. And the last one that we have here is pressure ulcers, skin and tissue injuries um, caused by prolonged pressure. This is a multi-billion dollar issue for hospital systems. They're very common in elderly patients um, and usually due to immobility, skin damage, open sores, tissue necrosis. Um, they're at risk for infection. Uh, happens in patients that are bedridden, wheelchair bound, malnourished and advanced age. The treatment is wound care, pressure redistribution, frequent repositioning, which can also lead to, um, the frequent repositioning can lead to delirium because if patients can't get good sleep, they become delirious as well. So it, it all of these things almost kind of work together um, in just uh, a way that's, um, it, it's very, it's kind of like a catch-22. Once you get into the cycle, it is very hard. 
the pressure ulcers are a substantial healthcare costs. This is a major, uh, major issue for hospital systems to reduce the burden of this cost um, on the system. Um, they result in prolonged hospital stays, frequent medical conditions, specialized nursing care, reduced quality of life. If you've ever talked to people with pressure ulcers and their caregivers who often get um, overlooked, uh, the, the quality of life is just horrible. Um, they're in so much pain. Uh, and they a lot of times they don't want to move because they're in so much pain. Increased readmission rates from complications. Um, they, you know, there's certainly negligence that's in, involved um, with pressure ulcers sometimes. Many pressure ulcers are preventable with proper care, um, but you need you need good nursing care in there. Uh, Long-term consequences, um, they can lead to complications such as sepsis and tissue damage. Um, and it's a public health concern, especially in the aging population. Um, as they increase, it's uh, placing a significant strain on the healthcare systems and our resources. So that is our top 10. Um, we have um, falls in and fractures, delirium, pneumonia, UTIs, heart failure, stroke, diabetes, osteo, dementia, and pressure ulcer. These are the top 10 things that as a, especially if you're, you're new or if you're not new, these are the areas that I would specialize in, really get to know them inside and out uh, and become an expert in one or all of them. But it, you could take one and spend the rest of your career uh, just tackling that problem. Thank you, Katie. That was amazing. Very, very informative and um, uh, very helpful for all of us who are attending this webinar. Um, I wanted to go ahead and take some questions now. So just if anybody has some questions, please feel free to type them into the question box uh, on your control panel. We do have a couple of questions. The first question, Katie, we got was, what are the key preventive measures that can be taken to reduce the risk of common health issues in elderly patients? Yeah, I mean, I, I think that um, some of the ways to, the key measures to take are to do a full assessment and not just um, of you know their, their health history, but looking at their medications, looking at their environment, where do they live? in what type of environment are they living in? Um, is there mold in the house? Are there other toxins in the house? Are there rugs? Um, are there multiple steps? Um, you know, how does the person get up and down? Um, a lot of these things, taking that into assessment uh, is, is a big deal. And in the acute care system, you know, we, we frequently overlook those key aspects, but um, and one of the issues I think is that transition from acute care back to the home environment, there's there's a big disconnect because it's not really the realm of acute care, but we deal with all of the complications that happen because of the situation that somebody's living in that uh, triggers or, or um, contributes to one of these health conditions uh, occurring. Sorry, that's great. Um, just somebody put in the chat, Jennifer mentioned in the chat, will the video be posted? Yes, the video will be posted and will be sent to everybody who has attended today, as well as everybody who has registered for the webinar, plus it will be on our website. And the second question we got was, how important is, is continuous monitoring and follow-up in the treatment of elderly patients and what best practices should be followed? Um, so I guess, you know, to answer that question, um, is there a, a specific condition? Um, I mean, elderly patients in the hospital system with an acute condition or elderly patients in the home setting? Um, there isn't a mention further of that, but I would think we, let's look at the hospital situation, hospital slash um, rehab. Really? Okay. Yeah. And I mean, so again, it would, it would really depend on what we're monitoring them for, um, you know, in, again, in the, the neuro unit, uh, in the acute care, especially if they were in the ICU, it would be, they would be under constant surveillance. Um, it, but 
again, that doesn't contribute well to sleep <laughs> uh, or, you know, that type of recovery um, in the step down units, um, they would be monitored every two to four hours, um, you know, to see how they were doing. Excellent. And then the next question is, what are some ethical considerations that healthcare providers should keep in mind when making treatment decisions for elderly patients? Yeah, that's a good question. And I think um, some of the things that I grapple with is, you know, the sheer number of medications that somebody's on. Uh, because for me, uh, treating symptoms, you know, it, it certainly has its place. But every time you add a medication to somebody's medication list, you don't know how it interacts. And so does it create another symptom uh, that maybe it's worse than what the first symptom was? And is there another way that we can help the elderly patients without them having so many medications? Um, I, I know I used to, and I, I hate to say it, but I, I hate it when like the nursing home patients came into the acute care setting because they would literally be on like 50 medications. Like it was crazy. Like, I don't know, uh, I don't know how the body can process 50 medications um, because a lot of them had contradictory uh, purposes, <laughs> right? So, I mean, how confused is the body receiving all of this additional information that it potentially doesn't need. And I think that's something, you know, that polypharmacy is, is something that we seriously need to look at. That's great. Um, I'm looking here. Uh, oh, we had another question regarding the slides and I will be following up regarding that separately. So um, Katie, if you can go to the next slide in the presentation just so that everybody is aware, we are offering a special discount today for people to purchase copies of Katie's book. If you have any additional questions, you can see the information there below regarding springerpub.com. Um, regarding the webinar, um, it looks like we've addressed all of our questions. So um, I wanna thank everybody for spending time with us today. And of course, a big thank you to Katie for such an excellent presentation. Um, as I mentioned, if you're interested in purchasing the book, uh, Adult Gero Acute Care Practice Guidelines, second edition, you will receive 25% discount using the code webinar24, all one word, at checkout on springerpub.com. In addition, the recorded session will be available on springerpub.com within five to seven business days, and uh, you can, you'll be able to access it. We want to wish everybody a wonderful afternoon, and we look forward to you joining us for future Springer Pub Publishing webinars. Thanks very much, and have a great day. And thank you again, Katie, for the presentation today. Thank you.